and these series of public lectures will be focusing on the geology of our solar system. So we've already had Sarah Russell in February and Dave Rothery in March talking about Mercury. Um, and today we have Pete Grindrod talking about Venus. So this lecture is part of our 2021 Year of Space series, the latest in our themed year programme. And this year we're directing our gaze upwards beyond the Earth to examine rocks, dust, gas and other matter across the universe to understand the formation and development of other planets. We have a fantastic programme of public lectures, outreach activities and conferences going on throughout the year. So please stay tuned to our social media channels and newsletters for more announcements. Today we have the fantastic Pete Grindrod from uh, the Natural History Museum, who's a research leader there. And he's going to be taking us on a journey through the rocks, landscapes and volcanoes of Venus, our neighbour planet. If you have any questions for Pete, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the talk. So please put your questions in the Zoom Q&A box or in the chat on the YouTube channel, depending on where you're watching from. We will collate the questions and put them to Pete at the end of the talk and answer them in the chat where, as we go, if we can. For those of you on Zoom, we're going to be running a poll so you can participate in that when it launches. This isn't accessible by YouTube, but you can see everything else that goes on in the talk. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Pete, who's going to take us on the fascinating journey to Venus. Thanks very much, Pete. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. And it's my real pleasure to be talking to you today about what I think is one of the most fascinating and yet still poorly understood planets in our solar system. And I think it's one that some, many of you may well have seen before, but not have noticed it really. And that's because when you look up at the night sky, the second brightest thing that you might see if the timing is right uh, after the moon, which is the brightest thing in the night sky, is actually the planet Venus. So in this beautiful ta photo taken at the European Southern Observatory in Chile, you can see three bright objects. And the really bright one at the top right is the moon. The second brightest one here, that is the planet Venus, which we're going to be talking about today. And also the, the much larger planet, but further away, Jupiter, is this third one here as well. And you may well have heard of Venus as the evening or morning star because that's when it's kind of most visible. And I'd like to be able to say now that if you went outside after this talk this evening and looked up into the night sky, you'd actually be able to see Venus, but the, the kind of the alignment isn't quite right. And so what you're looking at here is a simulation of tomorrow morning, 6, 16 in the morning from central London, from the Natural History Museum. In fact, if you took away all the buildings, and you can see that Venus is there just above the horizon. Venus has just come up, but it is really close to the sun at the moment. So the sun will already be, already be up. And you can see if you look to east, you'll see the sun. If you could see it, Venus would be there just next to it. And in between the two, there'd be Mars as well. But unfortunately, not now, but maybe some other time in the year, you'll see it as well. And so instead, we're going to explore Venus together in this talk. And this image shows the inner planets of the solar system, what we call the terrestrial planets, uh, scaled in size, but obviously not distance. We've got Mercury on the top left, and then we go through Venus. We've got Earth, which we all know, and our moon, and we've got Mars as well. And one of the most important things to remember from, from this slide is that Venus is almost exactly the same size as the Earth, and it's probably made up of exactly the same material as well inside but they are two very different planets. And so what I want to try and convince you of today by the end of the talk is that I would argue that Venus is the most and the least Earth-like planet in the solar system. So let's explore Venus. Now, like any good story or film, I'm gonna try and tell this in three parts. And here we begin with act one, Prima Gellin. And you may want to not know what Magellan is, but for a spoiler alert, it's the mission that you're going to hear a lot about later on. But I thought it's best to start with a bit of suspense and introduce something we don't really know about yet. OK, so despite the fact that Venus is actually the, you know, the closest planet to the Earth, our knowledge of its surface and geology is actually accumulated really slowly. And the reason for that is that Venus has a, a dense atmosphere and clouds, and it's completely kind of shrouded. And so we, it's impossible to see the surface from 
the outside. And we know that at the surface, the pressure from this thick atmosphere is about 100 times greater than here on the Earth, and it's about the same as being 1,000 meters under the sea. And it's this atmosphere that gives Venus such a, a high albedo, or the, the really bright appearance in the night sky that I mentioned before. And even the earliest results about conditions below the clouds, they came from kind of radio astronomy in the late 1950s and early 60s, which suggested there was actually a very high temperature on the surface of Venus as well, around about an average of 500 degrees or so. So we've got a high pressure and really high temperature as well. But before then, at the end of the, the 19th century, a common view was that Venus could be full of life if not actual humans, as we can see from this quote from a pro prominent astronomer at the time. Um, on the whole, the evidence we have points very strongly to Venus as the abode of life, living creatures, not unlike the inhabitants of Earth. And even if the thought of humans had waned less than a um, hundred years ago, there was still genuine belief that Venus could be a hot, wet, maybe even swamp-like planet still teeming with life. And in fact, science fiction in the first half of the 20th century commonly played up on this idea with stories revolving around life on Venus. And so that's always going to stuck in our mind as well when we talk about it. But it's fair to say by the 1930s, when telescopes on Earth are kind of detected mostly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it was generally considered that there, there couldn't be life on Venus. But still amazing discoveries were made with ground-based radio astronomy, which bounced radio waves off the surface of Venus and figured out that, now this takes a bit of explaining, Venus rotates extremely slowly. One Venus day is about 243 Earth days. And it actually rotates in the opposite direction to, to that of the other terrestrial planets. And because Venus only takes 225 days to orbit the sun, what it means is that Venus's day is longer than its year, and because it rotates the wrong way, the sun actually rises in the west and sets in the east very, very slowly, which is something that I always struggle to get my head around. But it's at this point that we could um, hopefully launch a poll for those of you watching on Zoom, where we ask the question of whether you think there is life on Venus. And if you start answering and throughout the, the talk, hopefully I can uh, convince you of, an, of your answer or not. OK, so they're the, the early days, but then came the Soviet Union and their basically tank-like series of spacecraft, like the Venner missions in the 1960s, 70s and early 80s. And some of these missions had an orbiter, like you can see in this image on the right, and some had a lander, some had both. And you can kind of recognize the, these quite easily if you ever see an image of them. They're very different to anything else you'd see, uh, kind of modern day missions. And this is a mock-up of the Venera 13 mission. And given the harsh conditions, it's no surprise that those landers didn't actually survive for very long on the surface. They landed up to, lasted for up to just a couple of hours, most of them much less. An interesting fact is that these landers were actually so well insulated from the really harsh environments outside that they actually overheated from their own internal heat because they couldn't get rid of that into the, the hot atmosphere. But we knew that they knew that was going to happen at the time. But even though these landers didn't survive for very long, their results are so important because it's the, they're the only kind of results we've got from the surface to the present day. So let's take a look at the, these images. To date, there have been 10 probes that have successfully landed, soft landed on the surface of Venus, returning really important information on the, the way that the surface looks and also the chemical composition. And this is actually more landers that, that have successfully touched down on Mars. And yet we still know very, very little about Venus in comparison. So I'm going to go through this handful of images so you can see them. And they look very different to what you might be used to from other, say, Mars landers, because the camera is kind of a different system that's scanned backwards and forwards, and it has a strange perspective that curves it over towards the edges. But at the, at the top here, you can see the first ever image returned from Venus. In fact, the first ever image returned from the surface of another planet, as this lander touched down about one year before the Viking landers touched down on Mars. And you can see it's made up of rocks. That's good for geology. 
It's made up of big rocks and small rocks. That's a good description. And there's also another image taken in the same year from a different mission, a different part of Venus from the Venera 10 lander. And the rocks look a bit different. We've got some of the fine grained smaller rocks covering it, almost like a fine grained soil or regolith, but there's also some flatter rocks there as well. And then in 1981, uh, we've got Venera 13. This actually had two cameras looking forwards and backwards. And it gives us kind of a 360 view altogether. And you can see these strange triangular spikes here. They're kind of around the skirt. They aided stability as these things came down through the atmosphere. And this kind of thing on the surface at the top and the bottom, that's the discarded um, camera cover or lens cap, which kind of split open and fell on the surface. And this is an instrument, an arm that came out and flicked down and tested how hard the surface was. Gives us some idea about the strength of the rocks there, what they might be made up of. But again, we've got rocks, big rocks, fine grained rocks. I want you to start thinking about what kind of surface this reminds you of from the Earth. We've got um, Venera 14 landed in the same year. We've got this similar sort of cameras forwards and backwards. This time, unfortunately, you'll see that this instrument that flicked out, excuse me, this instrument that flicked out here actually, excuse me, hit the uh, lens cover. So Venera 14 went all the way to Venus and measured the strength of the material that made up the lens cap. Um, but this kind of, this surface, it's not really kind of what you can, you can't see boulders, it's not bouldery surface, it's more of a kind of platy surface with some fine grain material in between. And with some kind of more modern image processing, um, these images have been re reprocessed by Don Mitchell to kind of give you more of a natural view, what you might see if you were there or with a, um, a normal camera. So you've got Venera 13 on the left, Venera 14 on the right. And I want you to think about what this surface looks like. It looks, um, well, barren for a start. We know that. We, we don't see anything that looks like life, obviously, but it's very rocky. I want you to show you what kind of surface this may well be. And although they didn't have very sophisticated, sophisticated instruments at the time, the, there were some um, chemical instruments there on board as well that kind of gave us a, a rough idea of the chemistry of the rocks. And basically what they said is that the, the rocks there were very similar to what we call on Earth a basalt, a basaltic rock, which are kind of a lava flow that come out of volcanoes, basically. Um, and that was true at all the landing sites. At one of them, the results were kind of a bit more iffy, but basically basaltic lava flows is what the composition said. And so how does that compare to a, comp a basaltic lava flow on the Earth? Well, I will never... Um, shy away from showing you holiday snaps. Here is the surface of the Earth. In this case, you can see some life in the background and steam in the foreground. And this is actually um, in Hawaii. So I was lucky enough to go to Hawaii uh, about 15 years ago and walk around on the, the surface of the crater there. You can't go there now because there's a lava lake too close. But I want you to look in this one. These kind of like smaller rocks look just like the small rocks that you saw at some of those landing sites. And if you walk a bit further, you see these and um, this is a very young lava flow. This is just a few years old in Hawaii. And this is where lava, the lava has flown and actually kind of butted up against each other and broken up and forms these kind of larger rocks that break apart as the lava flow moves underneath a solid crust of lava. And hopefully you can see some similarities there with what we saw at the Venus landing sites as well. And this is the wider view. So I was walking around on the, the foreground where you can see some kind of small shrubs. And to really kind of show what you can see when you go there, um, the right hand side, that rectangle will take a brighter look at that, uh, a closer look at that bright material. If you go and stand there, um, this area is actually pumping out poisonous gases. So you have to wear a gas mask, much like you would on Venus. Although obviously I didn't have the crushing pressures and scorching temperatures there. I just needed a natty geophysical poncho to survive in Hawaii. Um, and then just around the corner, down near the, the kind of active vents, and just for no other reason than it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life, here are some of those same types of lava flow, but now actively flowing and breaking out. It was extremely hot. And I guess to make them look more like the Venus images you've seen and you will see, we can just make those black and white, which is how most of the images look.
Okay, so to wrap up this first act um, and the holiday photographs, let's look at all the successful Venus missions. You don't need to remember all this or even take it in. The most important thing is to look at the date that these missions were launched. And so you'll see that the last successful Venus mission dedicated to Venus was launched in 2005. And that was actually devoted as an orbiter devoted to looking at the atmosphere. Before that, there were the Soviet Venera missions and the, um, the US NASA Mariner and Pioneer missions. None of those were actually devoted to, to landing on the surface really and taking images. They said the atmosphere and some made it to the surface. But by far and away, the most important mission that has kind of taught us almost everything we know about the geology of Venus is the Magellan mission highlighted there in green. And so it launched in 1919. It lasted for just over four years. So that means we're on to Act Two, Magellan, where everything changes. Now, as a child of the 80s, this is the picture in my mind when I think about a picture of space exploration. This is the Space Shuttle Atlantis, which is now housed on display at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So you can go and visit it. And this is how we used to do planned remissions back then. Um, in fact, both the Magellan mission that I'll talk about and the Galileo mission, which was a, a similar, very successful mission that went to the Jupiter system, were both vitally important in planetary exploration. And they were both launched from the bay of this shuttle. And this is hallowed ground for planetary scientists. And because this will never not look Cool. Here is the tremendous sight of Atlantis launching with Magellan inside its bay on Star Wars Day, May the 4th, 1989. And here's Magellan being launched from the bay of Atlantis just a day later. And Magellan had a mass of one ton. So that's the same as the Mars, about the same as the Mars rovers, Curiosity and Perseverance, that are exploring Mars at the moment. And that massive dish you can see on the left-hand side is basically the only instrument that Magellan had on the spacecraft. It was the radar. I'm talking about this big thing on the left-hand side. There's also this small kind of called a horn here that also was an altimeter. But this big dish was the only thing that used to point at Venus to record all the data. And so what Magellan allowed us to do is to turn our view of Venus from something like this, this, this planet which is completely shrouded in cloud, impenetrable, into something like this. It's fair to say that it completely unmasked the surface of Venus. And we now know that Venus is a planet with its own geology, its own history, and its own story to tell. And I don't think that we are fully there in understanding that story. And so I want to talk you through just a fraction of what we've learned and also what we, we don't know. So here is a image, a map of the, the whole of Venus from pole to pole, the full range of longitude. And this is a Magellan mosaic. Now, the first thing to say is that because Magellan had a radar instrument, what you're going to look at are very different from normal photographs. They are radar images um, where a radar kind of radar wave hit the surface one direction, was reflected back up to Magellan. And so a rough kind of way of understanding these images is that if something is bright, then it is genuine, generally a rough surface. And if something is dark, then it is generally a smooth surface. And so how Magellan worked is that it orbited around Venus from nearly in a polar orbit from pole to pole. And Venus rotated very, very slowly, as we know, underneath it. And it slowly built up this picture of the surface of Venus in these very narrow strips called noodles. And then those noodles were slowly stiff. Sometimes where the, the data would fall out, uh, there'd be data gaps, which are what the black regions are. 
And so this is the cycle one left looking uh, view of Venus, which covers about 84% of the planet. And it did this in just under a year. Then um, this is, uh, Magellan looked from the other way with the radar from right looking side, covered about 55% of the planet in six months. And then did something called a stereo lux. We looked from the left again, but from um, a different angle. And it covered about 21% of the surface. Um, it took the, the total of, of Venus C now to 98% of the planet at around about 100 meters per pixel, which is people often say is better than we've seen the Earth because we've got the oceans. Now, there's also that altimeter on Magellan as well, which could build up a picture of the the height, the elevation of the surface. And so this is a, an elevation map of Venus. And you can see quite a big range. Um, some of those mountains up in the, in the north there are kind of 11 and a half kilometers above the mean height, what we call the, the sea level on the Earth. But it's not really a, a fair picture because Venus is actually an extremely flat planet compared to the Earth or even Mars. About 80% of the surface is within just one kilometer of the mean height. And there are about a thousand impact craters on the surface, which you can see here with the stars. And they are pretty much random over the surface. And so that fact, coupled with the fact that these impact craters are actually by the, you know, relatively small compared to something like the moon or Mars, Venus is definitely missing the very large kind of almost planet scale impact basins that we see. Um, those two facts coupled together means that we think that the surface of Venus is actually, geologically speaking, very young compared to the other terrestrial planets. And in fact, it's something that we don't have a great handle on, you know, and kind of putting a very um, precise number on, but Venus's surface is, you know, probably somewhere between 500 million years old and, and a billion years old, which is actually relatively young compared to the actual age of Venus and the rest of the terrestrial planets in the solar system, which is about four and a half billion years. So that means that the surface of Venus has been, has basically been resurfaced. It's fairly young on maybe a, a near global scale in the last billion years. And if you want the punchline early, we don't really know how that's happened, but we'd love to figure out how. Okay, so let's move through some of the features because I want to show you them in detail afterwards. First of all, while we're on this map, you can see these features called Coroni. And these are my favorite feature on Venus. There's about 500 of them. They vary in size, but they're somewhere between 50 and 500 kilometers. And these probably aren't randomly distributed on the surface. They avoid the highest areas. They avoid the lowest areas. And they tend to occur when we've got these tectonic rifts where there may well be some kind of uh, spreading or rifting going on on the surface. And another punchline, we're not really sure how these form either, but I'll talk about those later. There are also um, things called large volcanoes. There's probably about 100 of these. These are all bigger than 100 kilometers in diameter. Some of them much, much bigger, as you can see. And again, they're not random on the surface. Some of them associated with coroni. Some of them are associated with, with kind of highs where there may well be some upwelling from the mantle. We probably do have a better idea about how these form on the whole. They're very large volcanoes. There's also some intermediate volcanoes as well, which are kind of basically smaller than 100 kilometers, and we'll get into smaller volcanoes, and I could go on and on. But basically, um, if you're a geologist, Venus is a volcanologist's paradise. If you want to do study volcanoes, look at Venus because there are a lot. And so one of the first things that people like to do when they look at something or somewhere for the first time is want to classify it. And you can come up with something like a, a volcanic family tree. Um, and it's just basically, it doesn't matter. It's not important. It's just a way of describing those volcanoes and seeing how things fit together. And if you really want to get into the details, you could probably split these up into what we'd call extrusive features on one side, which are like normal volcanoes where lava com or magma comes up from in the interior of Venus and is erupted onto the surface as lava. These are mostly surface extrusive features. And the, the other kind of end of the the scale here is the intrusive ones where the magma doesn't make it up through the surface and just has an effect under the crust and pushes something up towards the surface. 
So now let's have a look at some of those features that I just kind of went through. So first of all, a typical large volcano on Venus. Now remember, this is a radar image, so bright is generally rough and dark is generally uh, uh, smooth. And what you're looking at here is um, the summit region in the center of this feature called Sapas Mons. And you can see a scale bar there in the bottom right. But what you can see is lots of these kind of finger like we call them digitate features. These are lava flows that are flowing away from the, the kind of the summit of this volcano. The, the top of this volcano is about one and a half kilometers high, which actually isn't that high for volcanoes of this size on, on the Earth or especially Mars. If it's a shield volcano, we expect them to be a lot higher. So volcanoes, just like the rest of Venus, are actually pretty flat on Venus. Um, and these lava flows, um, there's probably hundreds, possibly thousands of these lava flows that flow on top of each other, have been built up over a very long time. And they flow for hundreds of kilometers, not all from the center, some come out from the sides as well, from the kind of flank vents. And if you want a kind of better sense of scale, where well, we can plunk down um, an outline of the UK and Ireland on top. And so this is, this is a kind of fairly typical large volcano on Venus. And as I said before, there are probably about 100 or maybe more of these sizes of features on Venus today, all about the same size as Britain, all from just these lava flows. Okay, now onto some other typical volcanoes. I can't show you them all because there's um, hundreds and you'll get into thousands and tens of thousands, but just an example of the different types. Again, people like to classify these. So in the top left, we've got something called a simple volcano, which is this circular feature with a bright dot in the middle. So we think that that bright dot is the vent and the lava flowed out fairly uniformly in this case to form this circular feature. It's probably very flat as well. Uh, the top right, you see something called a steep-sided dome. These are always used as the type example of volcanoes on Venus, when there aren't actually that many of them compared to the other types I'll show you. But these are often called pancake domes for, for obvious reasons. And in this case, well, there's different ideas about how they form, but one of the best ideas is that they form from just a really thick, viscous lava. So as it comes up from the center, it flows very slowly. So it also builds up at the same time to form this kind of steep sided dome. In the bottom left, we also have these radial flows. And in this case, you can see that we don't have a central bright feature, we have a central bright circle. And so this is probably a really good example of what we call in the Earth a caldera, where the summit of a volcano collapses back down into a magma chamber below the surface after the lava flow, the lava has been erupted onto the surface, the magma chamber is emptied and it collapses back down. So we see those caldera at the summit of a lot of the volcanoes. And then kind of a strange one, the bottom right, something called a fluted dome. We're not sure how these form, but probably through um, collapse and possibly landslides on the edge of the steep-sided domes to form these kind of patterns that we call flutes. And when all these volcanoes form together, it can form really kind of a beautiful menagerie of, of surface features. So in this case, this image is just showing dozens of these, what we call intermediate volcanoes. Um, and if you ever get a chance to explore images of Venus, so large scale images, maybe on display somewhere, I would totally recommend you because as you just get closer and closer, you'll see more and more detail that I can't kind of show you in something like this. And then where, um, for me, it kind of gets really interesting. Um, by far and away, the most common size of volcano on Venus is what we'd call a small volcano. And that is because these are the smallest volcanoes on Venus. It's an obvious classification scheme. But it means anything that is smaller than 20 kilometers in diameter. So here we're talking about something that is probably just a little bit smaller than, say, Mount Etna. You know, these are still big features by terrestrial standards, but they are small on Venus. And they, again, they come in a variety of flavors. And so you can see some of them on the right, the kind of different sizes and shapes. But one of the really interesting things is that they 
they're really common. And so to give you an idea of, of how common, um, here is a random 12 by 12 degrees of Venus. It's a fairly boring part of Venus, although nowhere's boring on Venus, uh, is my opinion. But as it goes, a pretty standard average is a better word, area of Venus. And again, for a sense of scale, this is how the same map would plonk down in that image. You can see it's a bit bigger this time than the UK and Ireland. And if you spend six months of your PhD looking at every single pixel and mapping every single small volcano, what you'll see is that there are probably at least about 3,000 small volcanoes in this very average, boring area of Venus alone. Now, that's interesting because we don't know if these are active or not. This is one of the really um, key messages to take home from Magellan is that it gave us a kind of snapshot in time. It was very difficult to, to look for changes in this radar data. Nothing obviously changed in the four or five years that Magellan was looking at Venus. And so we don't know if they're active today, but they must kind of be having an effect on the surface, these small volcanoes. And if you were to scale up, for example, this typical area to the whole of Venus, then we'd be looking at something like a million of these small volcanoes over the, the entire planet, which is incredible when they are kind of, when you think about how they interact with the other volcanoes too. Okay, so small volcanoes are my favorite volcano, but everyone needs a favorite feature on Venus. And I'm gonna try and convince you all that these features called Coroni are the ones that you should like. So Coroni is the plural, Corona is the singular. And these are enigmatic, mostly circular features that may well be unique to Venus. They're big too. I mentioned this before, between 50 and 500 kilometers in diameter, but typically about two or 300 kilometers is a kind of average size. And although there are differences between them, they all have some similar features. So in this case, the corona I'm talking about is this big circular feature. They all tend to have some kind of circular fracture pattern, these bright lines you can see. These are tectonic fractures where the surface has been altered by tectonic forces, um, either pulled apart or pushed together through kind of faults at the surface we're looking at. And there's other things, other features we'll see there that are often associated with small volcanoes. There is one of those steep-sided domes on the, on the left-hand side there as well. And there may well be a, a smaller corona down here in the bottom right as well. And so the, the shape of these varies quite a bit as well. This is a, a simulated 3D view of two coronae that just happened to be side by side. And you can see that, and this one on the left, you can see they've both got this raised rim and a central depression. But in this case, this one's also got a bit of a, a peak towards the middle, this one too. You can just about make out um, lava flows coming off. Here, the colors correspond to the height, um, but you can still see the lava flows that come away from the, the summit region. So these have similarities with volcanoes too. And we think they may, some of these may well be related. There may be some kind of genetic link so the same processes might form some coroni and the large volcanoes too, but we're not sure exactly how they're linked together. And if you want a favorite corona, uh, um, then I would uh, point you in the direction of this one, which is called Sulis Corona. And this is because I'm extremely biased. And so I was lucky enough as a, a university student to help out on a project that some other people were doing that allowed me to officially name this corona because I was working on it and it didn't have a name. And I got to call it Sulis Corona, which is named after the, the Celtic goddess of sacred springs and healing. And so there's a bit of a diversion here about how features are named on, on planetary bodies. Everything goes through the International Astronomical Union has to be officially approved by a committee for every, every planetary body in this case. And so for Venus, everything is given a, a female name. And in the case of Coroni, they are supposed to be named after fertility goddesses. But that naming system was actually derived um, back with the, the Venera orbiter data when we only had about a handful, maybe a dozen or so of these, these circular features, these Coroni, what turned out to be Coroni. And since then we've got 500. So the, 
the naming of these has evolved a little bit, but this is named after a goddess of sacred springs and healing. And you might be familiar with the name Sulis because the, the Roman name for the, for the city of Bath is actually Aqua Sulis, which means the waters of Sulis. Anyway, enough about the name. This is a super, super interesting area of Venus. This is Sulis Corona here, this circular feature, some circular fractures, some small volcanoes in the center. And basically this area has got everything going on. It's almost like a microcosm of, of things you see on the rest of Venus in this single image. There is an impact crater caused by a meteorite hitting the surface, in this case, fairly pristine. The bright stuff is the ejector. There's a, a bright central peak. There's some dark impact melt there in the middle. Um, just the one of them, there are these bright features, probably wrinkle ridges as the lava plains outside the corona cooled and contracted. There are some brighter fractures up here, which may well be caused by rifting associated with another corona or a rift system. Um, there's so much else going on there. Oh, the best thing, the, the most interesting thing maybe is this channel, the eagle-eyed amongst you might have seen this thing that looks like a sinuous feature. If this was on the earth, you may well say it looks like a river channel. There's even something that looks like an oxbow lake. If you remember your school geography days, it looks like the channel is actually cut off from itself and taken a shorter path. But this is Venus, remember? We've got temperatures of 500 degrees. It is extremely unlikely that this is caused or ever was caused by water. And in fact, the although we don't know exactly how these form, the best ideas say that channels like this, these canali, which sometimes flow for thousands of kilometers without really changing width, which is very strange, they're probably formed by lava flows. In this case, really runny, low viscosity lava flows. And so the fact that this has a what looks like an oxbow lake and is cut off means that the flow at this thing must have been, must have taken a very long time as well, long enough to kind of change its path. And we see those over Venus, they're extremely interesting and we don't know how they form. And in this case, it looks like there's some deposits at the end of it. It may well have been depositing lava at the end as well. So that is very strange. Okay, carrying on with the whistle stop tour of the the features. So um, just to make Coroni even weirder, some of them have these very distinctive uh, radial kind of spoke-like, looks like the spokes on a bike, uh, fracture patterns that I would call a radially fractured center, but some people call a, arachnids because they look like spiders. And again, we, we're not, we don't really know how these form exactly, but they do look like, or they have similarities with some features that we see on the earth that we know form above magma intrusions and so called dikes basically the magma's on the underground doesn't make it to the surface but it can still cause fracturing and straight lines at the surface and this sort of pattern is what you'd expect from a magma chamber in the center and those dikes spreading off in all directions and these fractures may well just represent an early stage you know the wee the wee baby stage of of coroni and although we think there's no plate tectonics on Venus. It's a single plate planet, although uh, there may well be some limited cases of plate tectonics. On the whole, there is no plate tectonics on Venus. There is evidence for pretty widespread tectonism or kind of faulting on large scales, especially in these very bright regions called the Tessera terrain. So that's these bright regions here. And what you see is complex crisscross patterns of fractures which means that there have been different periods of stress and strain and fracturing at the surface, causing these, these fractures in this tessera terrain. And these areas are usually, although not always, the oldest material in, in, in any region. So they may well be the oldest parts of Venus. And all this darker stuff you see has probably, in this case, flooded. These are lava flows that have flooded the tessera terrain, the low-lying regions, just like a sea may well do on the Earth, to kind of make it darker as well. But again, we're not exactly sure how the tessera formed, which is interesting. And then the, the kind of the last detail, last feature in detail with Magellan, uh, an impact crater. The impact crater is this circular feature here. You can see the rim. You can see the ejector, this bright stuff here on both sides. You can also see this gap here. This is called the forbidden zone. This is where the ejector doesn't um, happen and it kind of gives us an idea of the direction that the impact came in and the ejector kind of splashed out um, on either side. But what's really interesting in this case is this bright material you see 
going down here, it's actually flowing or has flowed just like at a lava flow all the way down here and actually off the screen. In this case, it's flowed for probably three, 400 kilometers right from underneath this impact crater. So there's two different scenarios in this case that could have happened here. One is that there was a lava flow in this region and the impact crater just happened to land on top of it. Or the impact has caused that lava flow. And this isn't just the only example. We see these very long impact melts, but quite a lot of the larger impact craters on Venus. And this is a bit of a puzzle because although uh, Venus is hot, it's only 500 degrees or so, to melt that basalt, those lava flows, it actually takes, you know, over a thousand degrees. And so it shouldn't make much difference to the melting of the rock that it's hot on the surface. Um, so we don't know how these lava flows form. Why do these impacts create such huge impact melt flows? We don't really know. Okay, so act three, post Magellan, everything since. What do we know? What have we learned since Magellan stopped? And to be brutally honest, that relatively speaking, there hasn't actually been as much science carried out on Venus since the mid 1990s. And there are a number of reasons for this. Lack of missions and new data is a big one. Uh, a lack of people working on Venus is probably the main one. And the kind of reason for the big reason for this is the probable lack of life, which has probably controlled both of, both of those things. And at the same time, the kind of counter search for life on Mars has expanded, meaning that there have been lots of missions and lots of people working on that planet. And if you want evidence of that, I, show, I think this is my only uh, graph in the, the whole talk. Um, this shows uh, a plot on the x-axis on the bottom time, 1960 to 2020. This is courtesy of Colin Wilson at Oxford University against the number of peer review publications. So that's the science that people publish each year for Mars in red and Venus in blue. And you can see that 1960s, 1970s, Venus and Mars pretty much neck and neck, except Mars kind of steps up a little bit in the mid 1970s. This corresponds with the Viking missions. Both kind of drop off a bit with in the 1980s, this kind of as, as kind of people started to look towards the rest of the solar system rather than just say Mars and Venus. But then you'll see a kind of peak with uh, a bit of a peak with Magellan in the early 90s. Mars started to go up too. And ever since then, Mars has kept on going up. And Venus has gone down, flatlined, and then maybe gone up a little bit. And some of these little spikes you can see correspond to missions, say for Mars and also you know, with uh, Venus too. And also keep your eye on this tiny little spike the end of 2020. But one thing I want to say is that in my experience of working on Venus quite a long time ago now, um, this doesn't actually reflect the interest and wonder that we, the scientists, have in the planet Venus. There have been many, many proposals to send missions back to Venus. And there have been ongoing studies. There have been some successes as well. So, for example, I mentioned we don't know if those volcanoes we see on the surface of Venus are active. But data like this from Venus Express, which orbited Venus from 2006 to 2015, um, it was looking at the atmosphere of Venus, but there were tantalizing results where a couple of the instruments could look through the clouds at certain wavelengths and compare the temperature it could kind of get from the surface to a model map of the temperature, which should scale very nicely with height. Um, it's a pretty uniform temperature. And it saw some anomalies. And it was a hint, just a hint, that there may well be some fresh lava flows or active volcanism occurring on the surface today. And there have been other complementary studies since then um, that have also said, um, there could well be active volcanism on Venus today. And that's using data like this, but also laboratory studies about, about the way that we interpret the previous data we've already got. And so, although we don't know for sure that there are active volcanoes, we don't have a smoking gun yet. 
I think it's fair to say that everyone I speak to that is interested in Venus would be extremely surprised if there wasn't active volcanism on the surface today. Um, and so I'd say there's been a, a low rumble, basically, of scientific studies looking at the geology of Venus over the last 10 or 20 years. And it's fair to say it's nowhere nearly the same as it was during the Magellan mission. There hasn't been the same interest. But then came the astronomers. And so you may well have seen this over the last six months ago. There has been a flurry of papers looking at Venus with claims and counterclaims and a lot of it attracting media attention, all about uh, phosphine in the clouds of Venus. And so the short story is that just last year, with telescopes on the Earth, there was a study that said that phosphine, this gas, had been detected in the clouds of Venus. And on Earth, this gas is often associated with, with life. And we don't have a good explanation about, about why or how phosphine should be in the atmosphere of Venus. So the implications of whether phosphine is there, you know, they're huge, if it's true. And now this hasn't been going on for long, you know, just over six months. But there have already been a number of studies saying that phosphine is detected, it isn't detected, or that it can't be there, you know, chemically. Or so another study saying that they went back and studied some old pioneer probe data and said maybe it's in there. And then just week, just last week, another study by the original group saying we've reanalyzed our data, recalibrated it, and we are confident that we have seen phosphine in the data. And so right now, I don't know where we stand with this story. This is science in action. It's extremely exciting. It grabbed attention away from Mars at the time when we're landing rovers and flying helicopters, which is amazing. And it created that little spike of publications all on its own. And so to me, this really demonstrates that people are interested in Venus. And that is, it is well past time that we sent missions back to Venus. And so to finish, a plea to watch out for the news later in the year when, fingers crossed, one of these three missions will be announced as going back to Venus. All of these, Da Vinci, Veritas, and Envision, are all finalists uh, with NASA, or the European Space Agency, ESA, to go to send missions back to Venus. And so if one of them or more of them gets picked, then I will happily come back and talk to you all about the geology of Venus in either 2026 or 2032. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pete. And uh, what a fantastic talk. And also I'm convinced let's go to Venus tomorrow. <laughs> um yeah thank you so much i had no idea there was so much volcanism on venus and i certainly didn't know there was anything that looked like an oxbow lake so that is news to yeah, me yeah that's a good one bit of a bit of geography a level popping up there and <laughs> um, we've had so many questions um so lots of stuff to ask i'm happy you. to give them a go i'll do my best okay i'll do my best to get through as many as i can as well so First of all, we have, what do we know about the relative size of the core of Venus compared to the Earth? Ah, um, so what do we know? Relatively little, because most of our understanding about the core of the Earth comes from seismic studies, so seismometers, and we don't have those on Venus. So the studies we have come from theoretical studies, so modelling, and also from maybe the gravity studies from, from Spacecraft 2. Um, we know that Venus doesn't have a magnetic field today. Okay. So Venus probably doesn't have a liquid core at the center. So it, so it doesn't have an active dynamo to form a magnetic field. But um, that's about what we do know about it. Okay, great. And other than, uh, questions about comparison to Earth, how do the corona that you describe like, differ or compare to corona or calderas that we see on Earth? Ah, uh, yeah. So um, I didn't mention it. So the, there's a few different ideas about how corona form. Uh, we're not sure which is the, the right one. It may well be different ones. But probably the most common idea is that there is uh, something like a small magma plume or a, called a diapir, much like you see in a lava lamp. You see this little blob of material rising up as like a sphere. And as it gets closer towards the surface, it starts to cool and slow down. It forms this kind of mushroom head shape and it cools and comes back down. But as that 
magma, or not magma dive here, but you know, less dense material rise up towards the surface, it'll start to affect the surface, it'll start to push it up, form those radial fractures I mentioned, but also some of it will start to crack through, form small magma chambers and erupt smaller volcanoes at the surface as well. And so these are probably different to the, the magma, the mantle plumes we see on the earth, which are much bigger and are normally connected to the core. These are very, very big features, form huge features of the surface. The coroni, if they are formed by these sorts of things, they're, they're kind of smaller plumes. And one of the explanations about why we don't see them on the earth is that we've got plate tectonics. And so if these are small features, the plates could be moving over the top at the same time and actually smear out the effect of a small feature like one of these small di diapers. I mean, if, if this was a talk in person and I was talking to someone afterwards and they wanted to buy me a beer, I may well give you my idea for I think we found one on the earth, uh, but I'll keep that one secret for now. <laughs> okay, good to know. Um, also had, oh yeah, so we also had a question about, you showed one of the slides how of different shield and dome volcanoes, and there were some linear features going across those. Somebody asked what they represented. Um, so Smart almost design. certainly they are fractures at the surface or faults. And so we don't have plate, Plate tectonics is not huge scale movement of the crust, but there's a lot of regional and local scale, you know, um, quite a lot of it could be to do with, so as a planet forms or a surface, a lava flow kind of cools, it will contract and it can kind of form these faults called thrust faults as it, part of it kind of rides over itself. But also if, if an area is cooling in one area, it means that it may well be stretching somewhere else and it can form a different kind of fracture, a, a grub and it pull apart. And so it's a fractor basically from some local movement or cooling of the crust or extension of the crust, but not huge global scale sort of movement like plate tectonics. Yeah, okay. So we had quite a few questions about plate tectonics and Joseph from YouTube asks, if the surface is being resurfaced, then does Venus have plate tectonics? But you said it didn't. So what is what sort of form of geological cycle does it have and how is it different from Earth's? Oh, there you go. Probably one of the most controversial questions you can ask. Um, <laughs> so the consensus has been, it doesn't have plate tectonics like, like the Earth does. So how does Venus lose its heat? And there's a few different ideas, but one of them that's been kicking around is that it could well be a global catastrophic resurfacing event. So the heat builds up and up and up and up inside until it just gets too great. And then it goes blah, and the whole interior basically comes out, not the whole interior, but you know, near the surface, comes out and the whole surface is basically resurfaced and you've got a young surface from scratch. The other idea is that you, you can't tell the difference between how that would look and how this different scenario, which is that you would have constant but smaller scale resurfacing from say areas of local heat buildup and coming up to the surface and resurfacing a smaller area. If you have that happening in a lot of different areas all the time over the last billion years or longer, some people say that you may well get a result that looks similar to the other scenario, at least in Magellan data. If we had different data, we might be able to kind of have a better look, but at the moment, we're not sure. So I'm kind of dodging the question because to be honest, one of the, the biggest questions in Venus science is how does Venus lose its heat when it doesn't have plate tectonics? And one of the biggest reasons is probably you know, to do with the fact that Venus is a tiny bit smaller and it doesn't have this liquid core and it doesn't have water there at the moment and these things are probably tied together we just haven't managed to untangle exactly how okay well hopefully we can get a mission there and find out in 2026 yep. <laughs> um this is a fantastic question from someone on zoom if you dug a hole in venus what would happen to your body if you were standing on the surface and how hot would it be if you dug a hole yes i assume okay. i think it's like if you dug a hole into the surface of venus like would things come out would lava come out would gas oh, come out? right right okay yeah. yeah um so we'll imagine you're in a, a spacesuit that is you know can cope with the pressures and the temperatures it'll look like a deep sea diving suit basically but with some amazing thermal insulation um it would just get hotter it would just get a lot hotter um so it wouldn't get any cooler as you go down. Um, it's 500 degrees at the surface. And so we don't really know what you call the geotherm, the rate at which okay. you get hotter as you go deeper down. Um, 
it would be like the earth you'd probably actually have to go kilometers down your hole would have to be kilometers deep if you wanted to hit something like magma okay that's how it is on the earth unless you happen to start digging at the top in the summit of a volcano and then you might have a bit more of a local magma chamber or something like that might be a bit hotter <laughs> Um, do we know what the temperatures are at the polar regions of Venus? Um, we, well, we've never measured it directly, but the, the idea is that it's very similar to everywhere else on Venus. Yeah. So this is one of the things about having an atmosphere like that and a very um, slow daily rotation. It's pretty much the same temperature everywhere, all of the time. I mean, okay. there are some differences to do with, with height. It'll cool down a bit as you kind of get higher. Um, but, but it's yeah, not as don't... different as Earth. No, no, or okay. Mars, no. Um, and so I didn't know that Venus spun in the opposite direction. Do we know why that is? <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> um, so there's different ideas, things like um, maybe a giant impact early in Venus's history hit it the wrong way and started it spinning the way because, okay. you know, the, the momentum that the solar system had when it was forming from a cloud of dust and gas is what we think is the momentum that kind of started the local rotations where the planets formed. So we don't really, there are different ideas basically about how that happened, but we don't know for sure. I don't know what it would take actually to, to really know that better. Um, but it's only the, it still goes around the sun the same way as the other planets, but it just rotates on its own axis. Okay. The other way. Very slowly. Interesting. Makes it makes it a little bit special. Um, lots of interesting questions about phosphine. I know you covered this some of this in the talk, but um, somebody said they know that it was recently discovered on Venus. Has there been any progress towards finding a convincing explanation? Could it have come from volcanic eruptions on Venus? I I think everything is on the cards. Everything, <laughs> everything's do. on the table. Yeah, everything. Um, so whether phosphine is there or not. I am, um, I don't know. I am, um, I don't have any insight into that. I would go either way. And I've seen studies and I read every study and go, well, well, I'm convinced that there is phosphine or I'm convinced that there isn't phosphine. It's so, it's so recent and it's so exciting and it's so new. And there's so much to kind of figure out that I, and I'm not even on top of this. This isn't my field. I'm not an expert in atmospheric chemistry or the telescopic observations that are used to, to detect it. But I know there was a study last week that came out from the original kind of team and they've gone back and they've recalibrated their data to, to really kind of make sure they're doing things correctly. And they said that we, we stand by our results that it's there. So I guess that's kind of gauntlet thrown down to, to everyone yeah. else. Um, and where it it's comes from- It's a very from, live area, isn't it? Live yeah, area it's, for research. It's really exciting. And, and the way that it's kind of, been done there's been quite a lot of um kind of preprints too so you get an early flavor about how it's going in advance of the peer review stuff as well which means that you're really kind of seeing the science in action which is it's just really really exciting stuff and this is all to do with data that has been gathered mostly from the earth from telescopes on the earth and some going back to pioneer data from you know 30 40 years ago and reanalyzing that right. Um, yeah, for the Venus fans out there, we are hoping to have Jane Greaves, who led on one of the publications that Pete shows yes. talk later in the year with the, jointly with the RAS. So uh, we're just trying to finalise that now, but keep a lookout for that. We're hoping to announce that soon. That'd be amazing. Um, something from YouTube. Are there any clues in the composition of the atmosphere that might indicate if there is any current volcanism? Yes. So that is one of the kind of complementary lines of evidence as well as temperature, there may well be maybe some changes in the composition associated with what may well, maybe volcanoes on the surface. Yeah, it's just, we haven't sent a mission there devoted to that sort of study or that it's capable of studying that sort of thing. And so something like the, the mission that's proposed, you know, something like Da Vinci, I think it is, which is a, a kind of atmospheric probe and it'll go down through the through the atmosphere on a parachute and take extremely kind of precise measurements of the composition. It should be able to spot anything that isn't basically in equilibrium and would be weird to be there as well. And so that's what we need to kind of really say that there's there's some gases that can 
can point to it. That's one of the best ways. I mean, some of the missions that, you know, one of the missions I've seen proposed or at least talked about is a Venus atmospheric sample return mission, where you basically just have a spacecraft that flies towards Venus, opens its mouth as it goes close to the atmosphere, gets a sample, collects it, and then just flies back to the Earth and returns the sample to the Earth. And then you can analyze it really, really re well with labs on the Earth. And then we probably know if there was any volcanic gases that shouldn't be there, yeah. Mm, that would be good. That would be exciting. Okay, um, we've got so many questions. Um, what should we have next? So what is the main reason why the range of heights on the surface, why there's a range of heights on the surface of Venus? Is that mostly down to volcanoes? What's, provi uh, what's providing relief? The, yes, to a certain extent. So the, the volcanoes themselves will build up height through lava flows, but they're not very high on the whole. There's some areas um, we call rises that are probably underlain, or we think they're underlain by big mantle plumes, like the ones we have on the Earth. And the plates aren't moving, so they can kind of push the surface up. That's not from lava flows constructing. It's actually from being pushed up from underneath. Okay. But then there's also some of that really old, or not really old, we think might be old, the tessera terrain, the really highly fractured stuff. That's in some of the really high areas too. So they may be high stand areas from past periods of different styles of tectonism too that could push things up like mountain building events. Um, and so most of the, but most of the planet is actually really, really flat. Most of it is, we'd call it unimodal. It's mostly with very close to the, the mean height or what we call sea level on the earth. And that's probably to do with the lack of plate tectonics on the earth. We have this, what we call bimodal. We have the very deep ocean trenches and we have the very high continental crust and they're made up of, well, different kind of material, the oceanic and continental crust, whereas on Venus, we don't have that. So everything's closer to, to kind of one height. Great. I'm just going to do, I'm aware of the time because we've gone past six now, but I will, oh, wow. uh, I'll yeah, just okay. do, a, I'll just do a couple more questions before we close the talk. So um, lots of people asking about what colours we might see on the surface. You mentioned that a lot of the images are taken through radar rather than visual images. Um, do we know what colours we might expect to find? Yeah. Um, so if you remember the, the last slide I showed with the, th the probe coming through the atmosphere, or oh, some of those surface images from the Venera 13 and 14 images actually had some colour as well. It would be that colour. It's kind of this, this kind of browny, orangey, light, haze coloured. Um, you know, if you sometimes see like dust storms on the earth and the whole colour changes, a bit like that. Um, and it would be pretty uniform. You won't see any variation because the atmosphere okay. just everything everywhere. Um, and so the reason why I showed the Magellan images in black and white is because that's actually what the data looks like. And so you'll quite often see these colorized images to mimic the color from, from the surface of Venus. But actually, that's not how it does look because the surface will look very different. And this is radar data. And so I've never really been a fan of colorizing the radar data, which is why I didn't do that. But if you're from the surface, then yeah, it would look like those Venera 13 and 14 images. Maybe like okay. the brightness would be like, I don't know, a cloudy, but an overcast sunny day. Does that make sense on the earth? Where yeah. it's bright, but you don't see shadows, that sort of thing. Okay. Would it be hazy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I think. Okay, that's a good bet. Um, okay, just one last question, um, which is, do you think that Venus might be a better bet for human habitation than Mars? Are there things about the atmosphere or the surface of Venus that might be better for us going and forming um, a colony there? <laughs> I think they're both terrible <laughs> for different <laughs> reasons. Um, so they've both got their own problems. I think that if humans are going to explore Mars, it would be as, you know, a scientific outpost. You can't, you can't live on Mars. You would have a base like we have bases in Antarctica mm. and you kind of basically huddle down in your base. And the idea of terraforming Mars is science fiction. Mm. And the idea of doing the same for Venus is also science fiction in a different way. But they're both terrible places to go as, <laughs> as humans. I think that, to be honest, the, if you want to go and visit as a geologist, which I would, 
I would want to see Venus, but to be honest, it'd be easier to go to Mars because mm. you just need a suit that will keep you a bit warm and give you some oxygen to breathe. Whereas on Venus, you need to combine the high pressure and the high temperature survival, which we're not very good at. We can do one or the other, but not both. So I'd probably go for Mars to visit, but neither to live. That's an excellent answer. <laughs> uh, I hope we make it to Venus, though, to get some more data. Um, thank you so much, Pete. And uh, for all the people who are fascinated by Mars and by Venus, um, the next public lecture is going to be on the 12th of May with Matt Balm talking about Mars. And then we're also going to have uh, Alex, Alan Fitzsimmons on the 30th of June talking about asteroids and comets. And you can go to our website to find the rest of the public lecture series. It's going to go on for the rest of the year. Thank you so much for taking us on a tour of Venus, Pete. Um, and thank you everybody to that came and all your fascinating questions. Sorry that I didn't get to all of them. There were at least twice as many as I asked. Um, but yeah, have a lovely evening and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks everybody. <laughs>